Make sure nobody goes that way. Engaged 
Um, ask brilliant questions. The authors always comment to us about how good the questions are. So that's a marker I'm putting down for you about the questions. But um, thank you for being here and supporting this series. It makes a tremendous difference to have this kind of support in the community with Dr. Lee. Um, and now for the business at hand. Tonight we have Clyde Phillips with us to interview Nell Scopel. He's a screenwriter, a producer, and a showrunner. Clyde has worn many hats in the entertainment industry over his 35 years. He was an executive producer and showrunner on Showtime's hit series, Dexter, for the first four seasons. He went on to executive produce and showrun Nurse Jackie. He won a Peabody Award for Excellence in Broadcasting, two AFI Awards for Outstanding Series, and was nominated for three Emmys and two Golden Globes. He's also, among his many talents, he's a best-selling mystery novelist with two Edgar nominations, and he's currently writing his fifth book, Insight, and he's writing a few of his own. And now, it's a great privilege for me to introduce comedy writer, producer, director, and literary powerhouse, Nell Scopel. After graduating cum laude from Harvard, she worked for the celebrated Boston Globe Sports Section. That's where she earned her credentials with my husband. Uh, <laughs> uh, she got a job as a staff writer for Spy Magazine, and it was an editor there who suggested that she write, she try her hand at writing for television. And the rest is history. She's often the only female writer in the room. She's written for some of TV's most iconic shows, including The Simpsons, my favorite show, Late Night with David Letterman, Murphy Brown, Monk, NCIS, and The Muppets, and the Muppets among many others. Um, Scoble's career has been at the forefront of addressing the gender disparity in Hollywood and in the comedy field. In just the funny parts, after describing an incident that happened to her early in her career, she goes on to say this. 25 years later, Hollywood still has a long way to go in changing its casual acceptance of behavior that ranges from inappropriate to criminal. In fact, sexual harassment is so embedded in show business, the industry even has a cutesy name for it, the casting couch, which sounds a lot nicer than the ring stuff. So, and that's why I want to be here tonight, especially to discuss the issue. As the second woman to ever write for the David Letterman show, when his sex schedule broke out, Scopely used the moment to publicly call out the lack of gender diversity in late night TV writers' room. Her criticisms fueled a cultural debate. Two years later, Scopel collaborated with Cheryl Sandberg on speeches and later on the book. So tonight, just as she does in her memoir, Scoble and Phillips, we'll dive into three of her favorite subjects, comedy, writing, and equality. But before we bring them up on the stage, we want to take a minute and share with you, Nell would like to share with you some of the clips from people that you might know where she wrote the jokes for. So let's play that for a few minutes. It will be a, ref a refreshing intermezzo for the evening discussion. tells me I should never miss a chance to reintroduce myself to the American people. My name is Barack Obama. My mother was born in Kansas. My father was born in Kenya. And I was born, of course, in Hawaii. This is such a special event that 
I took a break from my rigorous nap schedule to be here. <laughs> and I gotta say, there are a lot of friendly faces here in this room, people that I've been privileged to know and to work with. I just want to put you all in a basket of adorables. <laughs> What a 2017 it's been so far, huh, guys? Hillary Clinton sworn in as president. Uh, one week after President Clinton won, we all heard a loud buzzing noise. Either that was the sound of the whizzing bullet we just dodged, or it was Bill O'Reilly's vibrator. This is the third time that uh, Governor Romney and I have met recently. Uh, as some of you may have noticed, uh, I have a lot more energy in our second debate. I feel really well rested after the nice long nap I had in the first debate. <laughs> Everybody loves Michelle. We made a terrific team at the Easter Egg Roll this week. I give out bags of candy to the kids, and she snatched them right back out of the pants. <laughs> snatched them. But Donald, we have so much more in common than actually you may realize. For example, I try to inspire young people by showing them that with resilience and hard work, anything is possible, and you're doing the same. A third grade teacher told me that one of her students refused to turn in his homework because it was under audit. Clinton <laughs> <laughs> also raised eyebrows when she put her son along Martin has been to be in charge of brokering peace in the Middle East. I'm just kidding. I'm a stupid with happy. <laughs> And if Donald does win, it'll be awkward at the annual President's Day photo when all the former presidents gather at the White House, and not just with Bill. How is Barack going to get past the Muslim man? Most of those nights, not about the disagreements, Governor Romney and I may have. Uh, it's what we had in common, beginning with our unusual names. Actually, Mitt is his middle name. I wish I could use my middle name. Beautiful woman that degrees from Harvard. I have one. He has two. What a snob. <laughs> I was, of course, surprised when she opened an Aussie in Pyong Yang, but then I saw who she appointed ambassador. Anthony Weiner's gonna miss the internet. <laughs> I've even let down my key core constituency, movie stars. Just the other day, Matt Damon, I, I love Matt Damon. Love the guy. Matt Damon said he was disappointed in my performance. Well, Matt, I just saw the Adjustment Bureau, so. <laughs> Boston. I'm from the wilds of Dorchester, which is lovely. Uh -huh. 
Oh, so I'm the middle of five kids, and um, the my my father was really funny, and my siblings are all funny. So my aunts are really funny. So I I've never understood what people said like women aren't funny because my two aunts were among the most hilarious people I knew. In fact, one day um, my sister Alice was on the couch reading Little Women. And my Aunt Pinky walked by and tapped her on the shoulder and said, don't get too attached to Beth. <laughs> <laughs> they were snarky, and they got so much positive attention for being funny that, you know, I, I always wanted to be funny. And um, in fact, my mom went to my second grade parent teacher association. Um, I'm sorry, the, the, uh, the parent teacher meeting. And the my second grade teacher said to my mom, Nell makes too many jokes in class. Could you tell her to tone it down? So my mom delivered the message on my 40th birthday. <laughs> <laughs> and by then I created Sabrina the Teenage Witch and then for Bob Newhart and David Letterman and Homer Simpson and um, so I was really lucky that it was encouraged to be funny. Yeah, there's, there's a well-known memoir that I don't know if you know about it, um, by a miserable writer who couldn't it didn't make a success at a big television. It's called Cursed by a Happy Childhood. So you had a happy childhood, not I did. It's great. Yeah, although I get sometimes I'm jealous by writers who go out in like southern gothic families where they're, you know. Their uncles were alcoholics or vampires or whatever they do down there. Um, <laughs> but I really, I don't think you have to suffer to be funny. I, I think, um, I agree with Kurt Vonnegut who said, some people are funny, some are not. <laughs> Seven words. And as you can see, Nell is basically different when it comes to comedy. So I'll basically be her straight man for the first half of the season. Um, now, the structure of your book is sort of show business trope. Um, can you tell us what, what that is and what it means? And so, just as my career was starting to take off, I was working on a sitcom named Coach. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, Craig yeah. Nelson. And I was feeling pretty good about myself. And um, I was with someone, a friend who's right, who was a little older. We were walking on the Universal back lot. And he said to me, do you know the four stages of every writer's career? And I said, no. And he said, well, I'll use you as an example. The four stages are, who is Nell Scobell? Get me Nell Scobell. Get me a younger, cheaper Nell Scobell. <laughs> and who is Nell Scobell? <laughs> and in an instant, I actually glimpsed the future. I knew it was true because I, I, I knew some older writers were grumbling about the younger writers uh, coming up. Um, so the book is set up in, in those four sections, um, but the twist, which I'll spoil, is the final who is now Scobell was supposed to be me um, heading off to obscurity, and instead when um, it became an existential question of whether I was going to stand up for um, other women who had been struggling and for uh, the causes I cared about. And um, well, you kind of laughed yourself in that, in that trope because it's not getting this to the council of God. Well, I hope you, yeah, you loop around maybe. Right, right. <laughs> That's the um, so from the spy to vanity fair to Los Angeles. In your book, you talk about when the spec script, which is a script you write on speculation, the whole number. <clears throat> And it being so well received that then the job is Gary Shandling's show. This is Gary Shandling's show. Yeah, so that was Gary Shandling's first show before he did Larry Sanders. Sanders. Well, that never happens. People write specials all the time. They usually uh, tell a lot of people about writing specials. They don't write for a show you want to work on because you want to get them writing as well as the writers who already do it. But they love it. You got a job. Yeah, I. Um, you know, when I when I finally met Gary, he, he said to me, you write like a guy, um, which was the ultimate compliment. And I, I think he was um, 
please, like I remember when Joe was, Gary was fixing something in the kitchen and a friend comes in and says, do you need an extra pair of hands? And Gary says, that would double my sex life. <laughs> So, I think he was impressed that a girl wrote a jake check. <laughs> so, as, as we talked tonight, I'm not going to have all and many children in the right part of the hospital. So, feel free to straighten out whatever you need to. We worked on uh, what we call today the reboot. Um, it's called the Spuds Brothers Comedy Hour. And the Brothers Comedy Hour is really going to be the Spuds Brothers Comedy Hour. Maybe we consider that a great gift to have together. Because we're going to have a lot of fun doing it. Yeah. Um, it's going to be the Spuds Brothers it was kind of a misunderstanding. I had applied to be a writer at the, at the Letterman show. And um, I did have an agent based on my spy articles, which were humorous. And my agent had sent, sent the executive producer of this other brother show my Letterman application. And I think he thought I had written <laughs> the Letterman show, but I was secretly happy because I had met my stuff was good enough that he thought it belonged. And it was only years later that I actually did get hired on, on Letterman. Mm -hmm. So it was a really powerful passage of the book. Um, it's a very dark story related to your time on show. Yeah. Uh, which will lend itself uh, to a larger and more important theme for the would you please share that story in as much detail as you're comfortable with? And by the way, it's all in the book and names are there. <laughs> so there's, um, there was a head writer on this Mother's Brother show, and I'll say his name was Jim Stafford. People know him because he had a big hit in the 70s with this song, Spiders and Snakes. I don't know, does anyone remember that song? You. Yeah, I don't like spiders and snakes. Well, I really don't like spiders and snakes. And you were married to the Yeah, briefly. I think they got married. She was pregnant. They got married, and before the baby was born, it's they had split. So he um, he cornered me at a pool party and sexually assaulted me, and it's a very nuanced, weird story. Um, that's, uh, it's funny when I, it was, it was one of the first chapters I wrote when I was selling my book three years ago. And I was so nervous about telling the story. And then the October before my book came out in March, um, of course, all the Me Too stories started exploding. And then I couldn't wait to get my story out there and lend my voice. Because I, I think there, we, people have, um, this reaction where you look at someone who's successful and think, well, nothing bad ever happened to them. And, and it was a story I really wanted to tell um, because uh, it, it, even when I was walking to my car, um, I, I know so many young women think, like, I was stupid or why did I let that happen? Um, I knew I had been manipulated. Um, I uh, you know, I, I knew I had been taken advantage of. Yeah, and I did not for a second blame myself. That's okay. That was a new you took a few years after you. Why haven't you seen him join the Well, he, he um, spends most of his time in Branson, Missouri, and I don't get there very often. <laughs> uh, but it is funny, right? The story is actually funny, and it, I wanted it. To be funny of what happened. That's what you. That's what you did. To well, there's that great quote from her gardeners, the thousand uh, clowns, Sorry. where she says, um, uh, "If life isn't uh, funny, then things are just what they are." And then life is like a long dental appointment. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so jumping around a little bit, <clears throat> you're now a working writer in Hollywood with a few shows on your belt. And then a dream job offer came along, and you chose to drop it all in Hollywood and go back to New York. Walk us through what you were doing in LA, what the dream job was, and then please tell us about your experience on the show. So I worked on um, my big break in sitcom was working on the last season of New Heart. So I was there for that fun finale um, uh, with um, Suzanne Plachette and Bob Newhart waking up in the old Chicago set. 
Um, and I was about to start, a, or I just started a job on another, a new sitcom, when um, I got a call that David Letterman wanted to meet with me. And I had been sending them stuff in without anybody asking or even letting me know that it was received um, for years. So um, I was as shocked as anyone. Um, but, you know, it, back in the, this was 1990, and he was the gold standard in snarky TV comedy. And so many great writers had passed through the show um, that I wanted to work on it. I still remember my first entry with the, uh, any top 10 list. Um, and it was the top 10 least popular summer camps. And I snuck in at number 10 with Camp Tick in beautiful Lyme, Connecticut. <laughs> <laughs> and you would walk by your office and talk to you? Yes, they would come in and say, uh, how's it going? Can I get you anything? You want some soup? <laughs> <laughs> and you were the only woman on staff. I was, yeah. Uh, and we'll, we'll get to that in, in one second. But then ultimately you left the job. That lasted about five months. Um, and it was look, it, it was pre-Anita Hill, so we didn't have a vocabulary. Like I couldn't talk about sexual favoritism and sexual harassment and a hostile work environment. I just knew it was fucked up. <laughs> which was the only technical term we had at the time. Um, and since I had other options to go back to LA, I thought, what am I doing? I, I wanted this credit. It meant a lot to me. Um, getting it was the hard part. The actual job was easy. How did you feel walking into the book? I mean, I've had jobs that I hated. Yeah. I don't that shows that you know. Um, where I was miserable walking into the get out of my apartment. Out of my car, my parking place. So once you had the realization that you were going to be on TV, you talked about it, you talked about how you had a relationship with your own staff and everything. How did you feel about going to help me? Oh, well, we all knew. I mean, that was, that was not a surprise to anyone who ever worked. Well, but anybody asked you, how's your unhappiness group? Yeah. How did you cope with that? I. <sighs> Well, I quit. I mean, I don't know. Like, it, it was, um, I, it, it wasn't creatively exciting enough to put up with the other stuff. Because it, no. you know, from working on shows, there are shows that are very difficult. And, you know, Hollywood's got this strange system where writers rise up the ranks to become showrunners, and some are just naturally equipped to manage human beings, but others are just used to bossing characters around in their head. So when they become uh, that powerful, um, it, it gets abused. Mm -hmm. Also, it often happens when you talk to the show or you're watching the show. Um, you want to know, is the show ever happily married? Am I going to be here until two or more years tonight? Because he doesn't want to go home, he or she doesn't want to yeah, there was a famous showrunner at The Simpsons for a while who wasn't married and would make people stay to watch Letterman back when he was on at 12.30. Oh, and uh, everyone was always trying to fix him up. <laughs> <laughs> so it took a lot of courage to be Letterman, but then your integrity didn't end there. Uh, tell us about the article you wrote about Mr. Letterman, the vanity fear. Are you so. I leave, I go, um, I, that's when I jumped on coach. I was there for three seasons. Then I go to Murphy Brown. Eventually I create Spring of the Teenage Witch. Um, I start having kids. So I move into dramas and I work for Monk and Providence and NCIS. And I've long forgotten my late night with David Letterman days when 2009, do people remember? I mean, it's, they get, got, went on TV and said, uh, I, I'm being blackmailed for doing terrible, creepy things. And the creepy things are, I have had sex with women that I work with. And the audience applauds and laughs. Like they basically cheer. Which is true. Yeah. yeah. It's true. Yeah. 
And uh, I, everyone started having an opinion about that. People were calling me my hero for being honest about it. And I do admit it was a weird situation because he was being blackmailed. And, and uh, that's the very long lesson. He was blackmailed for $2 million. And they set up a sting operation, and I'm surprised no one's made a movie about it. But uh, but the, the one piece of information that really started gnawing at me was um, Emily Nussbaum, who, uh, I'm sorry, Nancy Franklin, who was a then TV critic of the New Yorker, had written an article about Jay Leno, and at the end she noted that Jay Leno, Conan O'Brien, and David Letterman had zero female writers at the time. So this is 2009, and there were zero female writers. I, as, as I wrote and ended up writing the article, there were three women on the Supreme Court. <laughs> and you need Senate approval for that. <laughs> so the idea that none of them could find women um, funny enough. So, I really felt compelled to write this piece that talked about the sexual harassment, but then pivoted to talking about gender discrimination in late night writers rooms. And um, I also noted in 34 years on the air, David Letterman never had a single writer of color. Not one. Like, you literally can't do worse. And did you also say that in 34 years that he was on the air, the, the, uh, the number of women writers does not equal the experience of one male writer in one year of that show. Yeah, the, the women didn't last long either, including myself, because it just wasn't a pleasant place to work. But so I write this article and I think my career is over. Um, I made my husband call our accountant to find out if, if I never made any more money with the kids still go to college. Um, and I, I was really scared, and it turned out to be the best thing I ever did, because it, it put me on this road, which led to Cheryl Sandberg and working with her on speeches and lean in, and um, and then ultimately to the book. So then you did some other shows, and this will be out of order for you. Um, Coach, you heart, charmed, monk star, the reverence on television group, and many more. And I may have spewed those out quickly, but what would you take the extraordinary accomplishment to make all of those shows? And somewhere along the way, you finally created the show, so the Teenage Witch. So tell us about that, about being a showrunner for the first time. What did you do right? What did you do differently? And then follow up with that. And Mitch Hurwitz, who created Arrested Development, um, said that um, running a show it's like piloting a plane while the passengers throw rocks at your head. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so true because you're basically like, hey, if I go down, we all go down. Um, it's, you know, it's so funny. It's true of directing too. You think you'll get to be the dictator and people will do what you say. But the truth is, when you're the showrunner or a director, you're just solving everybody else's problems. That's a question. Yeah. So, um, with Sabrina, I, it was a comic book created by George Lanier. I always like to give him credit. And I love the idea that the three top names on the call sheet were all women, Sabrina and her two aunts. And the three top names on the, in the writer's room were all women too, which I think is hugely unusual. Um, um, what would you have done differently? Um, or did you do it all right? No, I think I've become a better communicator than I was at the time. And I, I was scared of conflict back then. And um, that was stuff. What? That was stuff and other letters. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I, I, I think, um, but one thing I did right was we were at the pilot meeting, and the head of the network wanted something. Which, which it was at the time, so but it was actually a female um, at the head of the network. And I don't know if people seen the show. Sabrina's aunts are very loving, 
One is very practical, and one is kind of very emotional, played by Caroline, Caroline Ray, who's hilarious. And um, the head of the network after the read said, you know, I really think you need more conflict in this story, and could one of the aunts not want Sabrina living there? So she's constantly saying, like, oh, why do we have to take care of our niece? And I thought about it, and I said, you know, she's a teenager um, going through high school. She's not with her parents. I, I think it would be, if, if the aunts don't want her there, I don't know how to make that funny. Like, that doesn't make me laugh. That makes me very sad. Um, and I, uh, I fought that fight, and I won. So. Yes, did you have the show speak up for the several more seasons? Did you not have the person? No. What was that? Uh, I was, it's, it's a long, sad story in the book. I, I was very tired. I had to write half the episodes. It's a, you know, a new show. It's, you're, it's really hard to um, capture the voice. The first time tell a television show is the hardest job. Yeah. And, um, Two weeks before we finished, one of our story editors uh, um, had a massive heart attack right after work one day, and I felt like life was too short. I had a young son and wanted to have another kid. And, and, yeah. You think so? Yeah. yeah. You I'd be granted it, but. Um, we should. Okay. Um, you put another eye on it. Sure, in this week, is the parents of uh, your name, um, where she says, Why do the show is like you eat the death by your own <laughs> um, And then it was Ruby Brown, created by another summer islander. Oh, that is right. Um, to talk about that experience in your book, and quick as well, because it happens. Um, uh, about that experience in your philosophy of the four pieces. That's it, it's hard to hear. Oh, good. Yeah. The philosophy of the four keys. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> it's a good book. You should read it. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is something that, that my agent actually said you should write a whole book, business book about this. So, there's this thing in, in Hollywood where people say, oh, you worked on the Muppets. That must have been so much fun. And it's kind of like thinking, like the Oompa Loompas have a great time you know, like, <laughs> at the chocolate factory, but someone's got to clean up after the nut testing squirrels. <laughs> so the way I look at shows is I mean three. It's the three P's: the people, the process, and the product. So the people are obviously the people you spend your day with, the the writers in the room, the actors that you um, have to deal with. The process is um, how later you stay. We talked about that. You know, do you have a home life? Uh, do you have a boss that can communicate their vision, um, or are you constantly, you know, being asked to try things that, and failing? And then the product is, you know, are you working on something you're proud of? And then the corollary of, and does the rest of the world like it too? Because you can work on a great show that nobody watches, which is heartbreaking. Yes. Um, so the three P's, it's very rare that you're on a show where all three um, are really satisfactory. And a great work experience is you get two out of three. Um, more likely, you get one out of three. and. Uh, when you have zero out of three, you quit. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently. If we were together, we'd be all three. But uh, I think so. And Murphy Brown was the show where I, I loved the people, the process was wonderful, and you know, the product was something else you were proud of. Okay, uh, we're going to take a little shift in focus here, um, maybe a bit shift. Um, I mentioned earlier that I was going to be your straight man. Um, well, now I'm going to shape shift a bit and move from straight man to the straight white male. <laughs> or what Tina Fey calls playing hopscotch with landmines. Uh, the atmosphere in Hollywood, in, in many places in this country, is toxic. 
Yeah. Men are fearful and sad, and men are guilty, and they kill people. Yep, men are the um, I'm glad you said sad, because I think that's a big element. Um, and in fact, just today, uh, like three hours ago, I published an op ed in the New York Times. Which is on which is on right now. And uh, one of the points I make is that. The sexual access was part of the perks of Hollywood, you know, historically, going back to Louis B. Mayer. And um, I compare it to what's happening to if uh, an executive's Tesla suddenly wouldn't open the door. Um, and, and how angry that would make him because car doors and women's legs are supposed to open automatically. Uh, and so I think it is. It's, it's, uh, it's a little like Ashley Wilkes, you know, being sad about the passing of the South and forgetting about slavery and just thinking, oh, my beautiful civilization is gone for the wind. And, and I think that's a prevailing theory. Um, you talk about very often being uh, in mocking the world, the only world in the world. The tokenism, the short sightedness of it. And it seems like you were almost always screwing up. And you were vocal about it, and you were quite eloquent about it in your book. And um, it's, it's a must read for everybody. And let's move on a little bit, keeping with this. Yeah, well, I was just going to say, one of my very first jobs, or my first job, um, which was a short lived show on Fox called The Wilton North Report. It was a late night show. And, well, yeah, the other, my, the best part of the job, see, this is the people part, was the guys in the office next to me were Greg Daniels, who created King of the Hill and The Office and Parks and Rec, and Conan O'Brien, who created Conan O'Brien. <laughs> and, uh, but when that show went down, we were all sitting around talking about whether we'd ever work again. And one of the guys, Phil, said, um, well, no, you're lucky. And I said, why am I lucky? And he said, because every show is looking for a woman. And I said, a woman and nine guys. How does that make me lucky? But it it gets, I mean, it's, it's it gets so flipped. And I love that old saying that when you're used to privilege, equality feels like oppression. And and I think we're we're deeply into that right now. I understand. I agree. So let's talk about show Sandberg for a second. Yes. Um, we're going to forward to your book, which is called Lean In, and it says on the top page, Lean In, written by Shel Sandberg with Gus Bogart. That's a pretty big lead up. How did that happen? Well, when, when, I, uh, when I tell you how we met, you'll think, oh, of course. <laughs> uh, we met through Facebook. <laughs> and uh, I was an early adopter of Facebook back when you needed a college EDU address. Because I had a niece who was at Harvard who told me about it, and, and it seemed really cool. And through Facebook, I connected with a guy who was running communications there, and he um, wrote me one day and said, Have you ever seen Charles Sanford's TED Talk? And I wrote back, Seen it, I memorized it. In fact, I sent her a friend request, but um, she never answered. And then five minutes after I sent that email, I saw the little note that said, Cheryl Sandberg has accepted your friend <laughs> So it's the beginning of a beautiful friendship. And, and we, um, you know, Lean It was a book she'd been writing in her head for 20 years, um, but she was also running a big company. She had two very small children. My kids were much older. And um, so she would, you know, I talk about our process a little in the book, and she would outline a chapter, and then I would flesh it out. And then um, we're both type A, so we would iterate like hot potato and back and forth. That's great. That's great. I mean, then you um, helped her write her Barnard commencement speech in 2011, um, in which she said, or you said, or you both said, never let fear overwhelm your desire. Please ask yourself, what would I do if I were and then go do it. I would first of all think about that. Yeah. My daughter, Claire, um, was wanted to go to college and was going to college and 
was going to be a decision. And she said, rather than going to be a decision at a school I'm going to get into, I would try to be a decision at a school that is my reach school. Um, so what would you do if you weren't afraid of that would do it? And she got in with a decision to Well, that's great. Yeah. Thought of that. Thought of that. Um, somewhere along the way, you Yeah, but can I say that um, yeah. Cheryl called me right after this speech, and one of her questions was, she said, one of the students told me I was the baddest bitch. That's good, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's it doesn't get any better. Very good. <laughs> So somewhere along the way, you're writing jokes for the Washington Post on the And not just for the desert stock player, and not just for the dinner, but for the president. What was it like being in your office? Oh, so... No, excuse me, Russell, how's that working? Well, I think it's just a lot of fun. Um, I think it's just so writing for the leader of the free world is, um, uh, you know, a great way to serve your country. And uh, I did write the joke. It's a little hard to see where he goes. And I was born in Hawaii, and he does a big way. And when he did that, I thought for a millisecond, I had made the leader of the free world wink, and therefore that made me the most powerful person. <laughs> But he's like a sitcom character. He's, so, he's, he's the most powerful man in the world who lived with two daughters, his wife, and his mother in law. Right. <laughs> yeah. like, I wrote a joke for him, he didn't do, but, but he said um, it was like, you know, my approval ratings at 52. But I live with my mother in law, so I'm not surprised to have any approval rating at all. <laughs> I, I, I did that too, and I finished on your show. And, so, with all we covered, let's talk about the elephant in the room, and all of this, and in this other business, sexual harassment, and or using one's position of power to influence and bully someone else into doing his or her being his. Yeah. Like your side, talk about your side, how do you think that? Yeah, so someone once said to me, you know, you must be so happy about me too. Happy. I think this is happening because women felt they had nothing left to lose. And, and I do think um, Trump winning was such a wake up call. I mean, you know, for me as, as someone who helped write lean in to watch the most qualified candidate. In yeah, lose. I mean, whether you agree with all of her policies or not, um, you know, lose to this guy who since '86 I have been making fun of. I mean, Spy Magazine was the one who came up with short fingered Bulgarian, which started the whole small hands thing. Uh, so I think there's a Zora Neale Hurston quote, which is, "If you are silent about your pain." They will kill you and say you enjoyed it. Uh, and so I think women speaking out now is uh, it's about survival. Gloria Steinem said um, that when she that the most dangerous time for any woman in a domestic abuse situation is between the time she's decided to leave and she gets out. Yeah, she does. And that's the moment when the partner will do anything to keep her in. And she feels like we're in that place as a society. That, that you know, and with Hillary, like almost out that door, and, and then, you know, just got kicked in the head and pulled back in. I'm going to skip over a couple questions. So we'll okay. ask you about these questions. Um, so, what's to be done? We, we, we continue. How should change be implemented? Mandates? Quotas? Because many, if not most of our colleagues, seem to only be woke, if you will, to the idea of past mistakes and the need, the need for change, while others have no clue of the progress of the nation at best. Well, the, the two things I would say is one is um, I don't think it's a pipeline problem. Um, in my book, I talk about the broken doorbell problem. 
which is I think the talent is out there, women, people of color who are really capable, able to do any of these jobs are you know, pressing the buzzer and no one's answering the door. And instead they, they do you know, programs to um, find talent, the nurture talent. The talent is out there and it just needs to be used. And the second thing is I think men need to co-lead the women's movement. And, that's a great point. Yeah. That's a great point. And, and in fact, there's a great book called Suffragettes that just came out, written by Brooke Kroger, who um, teaches at NYU. And it's about men really push suffrage over the finish line. They were mostly the husbands and brothers of these women. Some of them were very influential Wall Street um, men, and, and so they, and they uh, supported these women. And what's amazing about this story is once the women got the vote, the men sort of receded and said, you take the credit. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think a change will happen until it's both genders demanded. But should it also be mandated? For instance, I had just a show down to and they had the you know, yeah. the rule, and it was a 50 50 rule. You had a 50% rule of directors. And because of that mandate, the Amazon shows are high more than the directors. Um, for them, than any other ever uh, in town. And it seems to be perfect. Yeah. I mean, would it be fair to have all? Like, think about it. Is it fair to have all men directors? I'm sure they're all men directors. Yeah. I mean, I think men have. Um, Benefited from affirmative action more than any any group. Well, it's right. There needs to be another another attack, another attack for affirmative action. Yeah. Um, um, I mean, look. I feel like when when I was hired by the Globe Sports page, um, they always hired four college students, and uh, it was the early '80s. Leslie Visser had joined the, the sports page. And they wanted it to be three men and one women, woman who were covering high school sports. So the reason I got called was they usually had Northeastern students and the one woman had dropped out. And I guess some people had said, well, we should just hire another guy. And then Storia said, no, find me a female sports writer. And they found me some of my articles from the Crimson. And you could say that was affirmative action, but I'll stack my career up to any of those sure, other sure. <laughs> interns. So it wasn't like uh, it was just he was open-minded. Last question before we go on, which is Nelson Bell creates a new show. Um, what were you writing with it like? What was the writing style? What would the writing? What would the well, you're, you're good to hire eight writers. So. Well, I, uh, I think you should cast your writer's room as you would cast your on screen. And the same way you, you bring in different voices and you want to appeal to different groups. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I tell the story about um, I was on the show Warehouse 13, which was the top rated show on the sci fi network. And I really a great show if you haven't watched it. Um, and I, I, there was a storyline where someone got was pregnant and had this very acute sense of smell. And um, I was on getting my notes, and someone said, well, Is that a thing? And I said, Yes. And they said, Oh, come on. And I realized I was the only one on this call of 10 people who had ever been pregnant. Mm -hmm. So it's not like women can only write women and men can only write men, but there are certain experiences that only women have and that only people of color have and that only older writers have and only younger writers have. And I do think on all the voices, you know, all the studies show that um, the broader voices make businesses better and more profitable. The, the businesses with um, more diverse boards of directors all have higher profitability. Mm -hmm. So that's great. Yeah. 
Okay, so we're in the miserable Anyone objecting to David Letterman getting the Kennedy honors? No, but I've always thought it was suspicious that it's on CBS, that show, and Johnny Carson didn't get his Kennedy Center honors till the year after he retired, um, and uh, Dave got it with three years to go. And Jay Leno will never get one that <laughs> stays on CBS. Well, let me ask the group, because people always ask me, um, do, you, do I think David Letterman can still get away with it if he made the announcement today? So can I say a hand if people who think that it would be a very different reaction today? Okay, and, and people who think that it would be the same? <laughs> All right, no, well that gives me hope. Maybe, maybe it has changed. <laughs> I really love spine magazine. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Can you say a little bit more about that transition from I mean doing sports to doing comedy? What um, gave you the confidence or made you think like you could do the comedy stuff? It just seems like it could potentially be a big transition. Well, sports, you know, you, you don't just uh, want to report the scores, that's boring. So sports is the one place in the paper where they really do encourage creativity, right? And because you've got to, it, it's the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. Like it's, sports are really emotional. So um, I think it was actually amazing preparation for comedy both in that you had to find a way to make something that was kind of boring and funny, and then second, being surrounded by mostly men in that room, learning how to drink really crappy coffee, like that, those were skills I took with me. Um, who here is re remembers who Will McDonough was? So I was actually um, in uh, the sports room when Will McDonough called Billy Sullivan after finding out that Billy had given um, uh, an interview to the Boston Herald and not the Globe. And I have never heard a string of swears like that in my life. And um, I think actually, though, being in that very aggressive uh, environment was, was great preparation. The gentleman right here in the maroon shirt. We'll get back to you. I'm just curious to get back to your craft. And that is, the things just come into your head that are funny, or do you actually sit down, think about the topic, make outlines, or is it just spontaneous? Um, well, sometimes I call it the muse gives you an easy lay. <laughs> And it just comes right out, and you know it's, it's the perfect joke. Um, uh, here, I'll read you a joke that um, POTUS chose not to do in his last year at the White House Correspondence Center, but um, I was very happy with, which was, um, I turned 50 while in office, which meant I had to have my first colonoscopy. And guess what they found? <laughs> Mitch McConnell. <laughs> that guy can obstruct anything. <laughs> so that started with me thinking he was turning 50. Oh, what happens when you turn 50? We all get a colonoscopy, and then the rest just came right to me. <laughs> Is there somebody back here? Yes. Uh, and then the there's a gentleman in front of Hi, I just want to start. I love sports. 
Sorry, did you see your question? Like, one of my favorite oh, shows. Yes. Absolutely adore it. Um, and I want to ask the. It was weird, right? It was like really weird. People don't realize how it's like we had giant clowns and, oh, yeah. and Lindsay the lead monster who jumped out of the dryer. I mean, it was great. Like, I still love watching it today. Um, but I want to ask, as a young writer myself, do you have any advice for like either breaking in or having the discipline to just sit down and you know produce the scripts or produce like something every day? Well, you have to keep writing. But the advice I give in the book, um, actually, I took from a friend of mine. Um, one of the things really good TV writers learn to do is you take the best lines from the room from everyone else. Best idea. Yeah. So. Um, this came from my friend Amy Cohn, who once said to me, the only way to move forward creatively is to allow yourself to be judged. So it's not just what you start, and it's not just what you finish, it's what you put out in the world to see. Yeah. Gentlemen, I just want to ask, how did you end up uh, starting to write for the president? Oh, and so I tell the story in the book. It's kind of why I he the president went to Facebook and Facebook asked me to write some remarks, actually for Mark Zuckerberg, and one of them um, had was kind of made fun of the president, and they wrote they wrote me and said, "Now we're trying to honor the man, not roast him." Um, but they showed John Favreau, uh, the speechwriter, yeah, the speechwriter, and some of the, the that joke and he wrote to me and said could we use it um so that was the beginning and it was so much fun <laughs> he's not like johnny carson's timing he's so good so this young lady back there yeah. well, we can help you with that Just curious what um, books and TV shows and TED Talks you think are sort of crucial for young writers to consume? Well, I do think Cheryl's TED Talk, which is why we have so few women leaders, is the best 12 minutes you can spend if, if you sort of want, want to understand why women drop out of the workforce. Um, it, I really changed the way I was looking. I had looked at my own life. And one of the things she tells you is um, she instructs women to sit at the table. And I love that because she means it metaphorically, the table where decisions are made. But she also means it literally. And it really connected because when I was a story editor at Newhart, I wrote my first script. And we went to the table read, which you know, all the actors sit around the big table. With the network and the studio. Yeah, and um, my name's on the script, and I came in and I sat on the periphery with the assistants. And no one waved me over. And at the time, I think I thought, like, um, I don't want to be pushy, and I don't want to come across as too aggressive. And I really thought it was my choice. And it wasn't until 30 years later when I'm watching Cheryl's TED Talk that I thought, our culture forced me into that position. It, it wasn't really a choice. It's also who, who was running the show. So you had to you know, yeah. watch it, you didn't have to sit next to it. Really? You know how you put your hand up you know the person who had to do with your thoughts? It was who was running the script. Yeah, no one even introduced me to Bobby Hart. I didn't, I didn't actually meet him until the very last day, but we had a very meaningful conversation. I wonder if you guys want to know what this piggy is like. <laughs> What's next for you? Um, I would like to direct another movie. I directed a Lifetime movie and a Showtime movie, and um, have you directed? No. It's so challenging. It's really hard. Um, and uh, I've got a script that I'd love to. Um, yeah, yeah. It's a black comedy. So that would be fun. Let's kind of up right here. Thank you.
Obviously a very durable machine.